Okay. Well, I who I'm never late, two minutes late. That's because I got hung up in the wood pile and lost track of time. <laughs> so anyway, all right. We're going to have two topics um, this morning, early in September. The first one is going to be on green manure, how to use it in your garden, maybe, and then frost. And as I said, what are we doing here? <laughs> My technical help, the librarians are coming and playing with the computer. What's happening? Should be. It is on speaker. And what's Kelly? Is that a, that's somebody's name? Yes. Okay. Well, hi, Kelly, if you can hear us. It seems that every two weeks, the computer decides to change its mind. So you have to press a different series of buttons. Okay. Hmm. You can keep talking, Mary Lou. Can I? Yeah. It, it's working. It's just, yeah. We're just trying to get the visuals. Trying to get the visuals. Oh, okay. Where was I? Ah. Green manure and frost. And uh, we'll start with the green manure, but I want to show you later this wonderful book. And as I said, as I came in, kind of got, I've read this book two, three years ago. I reread it yesterday and today. And there's way too much information for a 101 level discussion of frost. So we're going to deal with the simple surface. And if we do this program next summer, I'm going to up the level to O2. And so we're, our, our talks will be a little more complicated and we can cover the real intricacies of frost next year. All righty, green manures. Um, Rima, I was gonna ask you, because you helped me find some images, which we will eventually find here to show everybody. Um, do you remember what we talked about a couple of weeks ago about green manure in the gar vegetable garden or not? What did we decide to use here if we used it? Do you remember? Well, the pictures are of rye. Winter rye. Winter rye, and there was another one. Buckwheat, which is, a, which is not a winter. Um, it, it's not hardy, so we don't use it in the winter. Well, let me just talk a little bit about what green manures are. And let's start with Mother Nature. If you look around the world, even going as far south as Antarctica, Mother Nature does not expose the earth. It's always covered with something from the jungle to the prairies to the deciduous forests to the deserts. There's always plant cover, unless you have a disaster like a flood or a fire. But very rapidly, the plants take back over. Now, when we started, I'm going to turn so I can see, Rima. When we started farming about, let's say, 10,000 years ago, Suddenly, we started doing things quite differently than Mother Nature did. And just think about, you know, when you drive west through, say, Kansas on the way to California, mm -hmm. um, at certain times of the year, if it's spring, they're burning the fields. And I mean square miles. They don't have little fields. They have big fields out there. Or um, they're plowing the ground in the fall, leaving the soil sitting out there exposed to the wind and the rain which cause erosion. And you begin to lose over time your topsoil. Sometimes sooner, such as the Dust Bowl, a lot of Oklahoma's topsoil wound up in California and the Pacific Ocean. No, wait a second, the wind blew the other way. It wound up here covering the East Coast and on out. Wow, that far. The... Oh yes. You know, they're now with the satellite or high flying planes, you know the Sahara Desert? Now the winds tend to come from the east there and you can see red cloud dust coming out the edge of Africa over the Atlantic Ocean. Wow. And if you were a soil scientist and used your microscope and you went down to Florida in the backyard, you could find Sahara red soil dusting your huh. Florida sandy soil. Huh. Mm. It moves around. Okay. Yeah, sure does. Which, if human beings weren't around and had to feed ourselves, it wouldn't matter. You know, life goes on, everything changes. But um, it can become devastating if we don't take care of our soil. 
Now, maybe I better follow my notes, otherwise I'm gonna wander around too far because there's too much to say in all sorts of different directions. Um, once going, going back to mother nature, we all know if we know anything about American history is that when we finally in the 1800s got to the Midwest, let's say Western Illinois, Indiana, into Iowa, the tall grass prairie, that became one of the bread baskets of the world, just like Ukraine is, which is one of the reasons we're having problems with food because we have lost access to much of that. So the Ukrainian soils like the bread basket in the Midwest um, were very rich, very deep, very humus rich soils. Mm -hmm. Because think of, think of Iowa, the glacier started retreating about 10,000 years ago, rounded off. Ever since then, before humans started uh, farming there, extensive farming, the grass would grow, the grass would die. The voles would live maybe a year and they would die. And everything sort of stayed put. All the organic matter, plants, animals, pretty much didn't migrate that far and therefore rotted down into the topsoil to become humus, which the following spring provided uh, the nutrients for the plant's roots to grow again. And so year by year, decade by decade, century by century, those soils got deeper and deeper and richer and richer. And then along came our pioneering um, forefathers and they plowed it all up and planted whatever. Mm -hmm. Wheat, corn, soybeans, maybe sunflowers now. Um, and, that, and, that, and they often burnt off you know, in the spring, the idea being we'll get rid of the weed seeds, we'll get rid of the bugs, which it did. Um, and they plowed in the fall because once again, it was usually dry enough to plow in the fall couldn't wait till spring because then you might have a wet spring and then you'd be late to plant. Right. And so there the soil sat exposed to the prairie winds. Anybody that's been out there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and year by year, decade by decade, was in a very short time with the erosion and the depletion, we began to lose our topsoil and became less rich. And then after the Second World War, we discovered fertilizer, chemical fertilizer. And all of a sudden it's like, Oh, I just need the soil to hold the roots in place so my plants will, you know, not fall over. And I can just feed it with all these chemicals. Hmm. And so that began to happen, especially on the big commercial farms, because it was so much easier and so much cheaper in the beginning. But year by year, under that regimen, the soil died more and more and more and became dirt, not soil, <laughs> became dirt. All righty. Um, I think of it like a bank account. If you have a certain principal, let's say $1,000 in your bank savings account, and then every year you get a certain amount of interest, let's say $100. Now, if you live on the interest, $100, and leave the principal sitting there, you'll always have it. But with the modern farming, the way they used to do it, and many still do, what they quickly used up was the interest. That was that humus that built up one, every year. Right. They used that up and then they started using up the principal. Huh. And of course, what happens when you use up all your principal, you become bankrupt. <laughs> you have zero left. And that's what's happened on many of those big super farms out in our Midwest. Um, <clears throat> so in the vegetable garden, You could say it's a small scale, big commercial operation. Instead of 10 square miles of a wheat field, you have maybe a thousand square feet of your vegetable garden. Mm -hmm. So nothing's gonna be as drastic as we see, you know, like during the Dust Bowl. However, there are many um, horticultural techniques involving several things, including green manure that you can utilize that will help keep your soil, soil, and not dirt and healthy and therefore able to produce more healthy and more food for you in that same thousand square feet. Now, why? Uh, 
a green manure crop, such as we're going to use as an example, winter rye, because that suits us here in Allegheny County mm. quite well. Um, when most of your vegetables are done somewhere around the middle of September, the end of September, and you've dealt with that, your harvest, instead of leaving, well, there's two, two ways you can go. You can mulch your soil, say with leaves. That also protects the soil from that's erosion. Right? Yeah, that's what I do. And the reason I do that is that if you grow, say, winter rye as a cover crop for the winter, a green manure crop, you can't turn it under till the middle of May. And if anybody's heard me go on and on about plant your stuff early, like the first week in April, if you're growing winter rye there, you can't do that. Because, you know, to get the benefit of the organic matter from the roots and the six or eight inches of the green top, you really should wait till around the middle of May to turn it under. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it seems late, doesn't it? Yes. So that'd be fine for things like tomatoes, corn, pepper, you know, squashes, the things that you don't put in till the end of May. Um, so, but that's a personal decision. Either way, mulching, say with leaves or planting winter rye, you will be increasing the organic matter, which changes to humus, which feeds, um, releases the nutrients that are in the soil so the plant can absorb them. So if you want to try this, um, I would suggest winter rye. If you plant it by the middle of September or possibly even the 1st of October, which is around the last frost, it will uh, uh, germinate and begin to grow an inch or two or even three before really cold weather sets in mm -hmm. and, that, and it stops it. Mm -hmm. But the way we've been having our autumns lately, my guess is it'll stay green all the way into December. Yeah. My lawn stayed yeah, green. I was just thinking it's that. <laughs> it's very green. <laughs> Christmas. So it's a good season for uh, certain green manures. Then you, you wait. You don't want it to um, flower and set seed uh, because you don't want rye in your garden as a weed. So usually around the middle of May, which is usually when it's dry enough to work the soil. You can turn it under, maybe flip it six, eight inches, let a week go by, it begins to rot down, and then you can sow your warm crops like corn or set your tomatoes out or whatever. But I was also thinking, um, okay, before I go there, not only does it eventually add more organic matter, which is like the cream on the pudding in your garden soil the more the better um it prevents erosion from both heavy downpours which we seem to be getting more of lately either it rains or it doesn't rain nothing in between these days seems like and it keeps the wind from blowing the dry soil which when it freezes it dries away but the third thing which most people don't realize is that uh, leaching of uh, certain nutrients, especially nitrogen, that's still in your garden in the fall. And if you don't plant anything to absorb the nitrogen, oh. it will leach away in the rainwater. Yep. And that's why we have all these problems with um, the algae blooms this summer uh, because of farm fertilizer runoff into the rivers and lakes and ponds. Um, so if you can absorb that extra nitrogen by having the rye growing, it will be captured by the rye and then free to be used in the spring when you plow it under and it begins to rot down. So that's something most people don't realize, but it's a, another plus for doing mm. that rather than mulching. Okay, but I was thinking we were taught, uh, there's no reason why Say you have a corn plot that's, I don't know, 20 feet long and five feet wide. But as you know, the corn stalks are about eight inches a foot apart, depending on the variety, right? right? Who wants to try and hoe to keep the weeds down? Now you could mulch, but why not plant some clover? Mm -hmm. Either the short white Dutch clover that you put in your lawn or the taller growing red clover, um, which you can sow at the same time as the corn 
because I believe clover is killed off by the heavy frost. I'm not sure the roots are, but um, the tops are. So in mid-May, when you put, put your corn seed in, um, put the clover in between in the rows. Now, it will do a couple of things. Like mulch, it'll keep the soil cooler as the sun, you know, it gets hotter in the summer. It'll, mm, now it probably won't keep the moisture in as well because it's using moisture to grow. Um, but it'll keep the weeds down if you sow it thickly. And it doesn't grow that tall. Right. So it'll make like a, a, um, a, a rug. Yeah. Anywhere from four inches high to eight inches high, 10 inches high maybe for the red. And it's providing nitrogen, mm -hmm. which corn is a hog for. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So the other, and um, I suppose you could also put it around your broccoli. Although that goes out earlier. Um, you can think about it. You know, things that are spaced out more in the garden and then just sort of sit there and fill up with their, the ground around them as bare. I was just thinking about trying to grow corn and the raccoon. Issues. And the raccoon. Like well, if, only the, if only the clover was something raccoons hated and wouldn't walk across, but no. Rima's problem is she's a uh, vegetarian. <laughs> Now my daddy, if he were still alive, would take care of your raccoons and would he would make up a nice stew with them. Oh, and a hat. <laughs> anyway, okay. Um, the other thing that you can use, not so much as a green manure, but uh, maybe a renovator. We looked up buckwheat, which is not a grass. Oh yeah, do you want to show pictures? Let's show pictures. While she's hunting up pictures, buckwheat is um, a frost tender plant that grows about two or so feet high. And um, it does a couple of things. If you sow it thickly in the middle of May, late May, it takes about 90 days to harvest if you want the buck wheat, for, uh, grains to make, not grains, uh, seeds, I guess, to make the um, buckwheat pancakes, the flour. You have to let it go at least 90 days. So come late August, early September is when you would harvest the buckwheat for the grain. I guess it's a grain. Well, I don't know what it is exactly. You can look, Google it, guys. Um, however, if you plant it as a cover crop, it helps get rid of the weeds because it grow, if you sow it very thickly, like two to three times what you would for a crop, and it tends to kill off or there keep the weeds from growing. So anyway. Can we enlarge screen that? sharing? You know, Mel and I messed with this yeah, um, and could not get it to get bigger. We tried uh -huh. a variety of things. So unfortunately, no. Now, can... Oh, wait a minute. I was going to say, could Kelly make it larger on hers in spite of what we can do with ours? Yeah, so instead, I think... Hey, Kelly, can you tell us if you can see this? Maybe if it's gave large. Up. Kelly, you still there? Well, anyway... All righty, so. Um, Are you able to hear me? I think I hear somebody. I do. Can you hear me okay? I can see it. You did make it larger. Oh, look, oh okay. okay. It's, yep. so it's a little fuzzy, but you get the idea of it. Correct. We yep. that flowering. Yeah. Go Good. Thanks, Kel. All yep. righty. Cool. Now we're going to move on to a frost. And before we do, I want to, um, Kelly and whoever else is there, or if you're going to listen to it, you know, sometime in the next couple of weeks. Wait, how do I hold this up? There you go. Flower? Okay. This is an absolutely wonderful book. And I'm a real harsh critic. I don't give out A's very often. <laughs> More often than not, there are C's and C minuses. <laughs> anyway, this is a great book. The Gardener's Guide to Frost by Philip Harden. H-A-R-N-D-E-N. H -A -R -N -D -E -N. Now it's 20 years old, but it's timeless. Um, and except for one paragraph about the moon, <laughs> he gets an A, A plus. And I wrote in the side of the book, what? Next is paragraph about the moon. So we won't even talk about that. Um, however, it's very detailed and it's very complicated. And I, I realized as I try to sort it out and simplify it and get to the basics, couldn't do it in a half hour program, mm -hmm. especially a 101 level. So we're going to bumble along here and get the basics out this time. And if we do this program next year, I'm going to up the, as 
you know, make it a little more complicated. Mm -hmm. We can talk about, you know, because I'm basically was a scientist once, so I get carried away by the science and the charts. And I realize that probably 95% of the world now, what do you do to get the weather report, Rima? Oh, I go online. Oh, you go online. I listen to the radio oh. or the Alfred Sons predictions. You can't really get the radio where we live. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, <laughs> uh, most radio stations, even NPR, do not give a really good, they give a B minus weather report. So anyway, but very, very, very few people want to figure it out for themselves. But it is fascinating. And um, so we'll just do one or two of those. I'm going to figure it out for myself and not believe the weather report okay. or whatever. All righty. Um, now, frost, if we talked in the spring, we'd be mentioning different things because frost behaves differently in the spring than it does in the fall. So we're just going to deal with how can I extend my garden another two or three weeks by missing? We're going to avoid getting zapped by that first early frost all right okay okay um now you would think the climate is getting warmer and and our falls are extending the frost is moving further into the october but because of our erratic weather that combines with this you can never trust it which is really frustrating i think 30 years ago when the frost came around the 21st of September on the average, it was pretty, you didn't pretty much knew. Mm -hmm. Now it's, it comes later, like last year, the frost, remember, didn't come to the 18th of October. Yeah, it was late. Very late, uh, almost three weeks later than the average. But you can't, but it could have come three weeks earlier. So anyway, we here in Allegheny County have moved up into zone 5A which means two things. The average coldest it ever gets in January, usually January, is minus 20. And that means also the frost-free period has shifted now from the middle of May, it's backed up 10 days, to the 1st of October, it moved up 10 days. So now we have, a, on the average, 140 frost-free days. Um, usually from the middle of May to the 1st of October. Now, one problem with listening to the local weather report. Now, when I read the, um, the week's report in the Alfred Sun, I always subtract three degrees in the temperature because I live um, 400, 500 feet that, higher so. up you know, on the top of the hill. Mm -hmm. And so the temperature changes if everything else is the same. You know, it's not like a cold front coming through. So if Kelly says it's gonna be another Kelly, I don't think you're the Kelly that writes the weather report. Um, <laughs> nope, I don't. Because, huh? <laughs> nope, I do not. Nope, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Um, if Kelly says it's gonna be about uh, 76 today, I say, well, that means up on my hilltop, it's probably going to be 73. Okay. And I'm always windier up there also. Mm, yeah. So this is what is known as a microclimate. So you have the general climate, you know, maybe all of Allegheny County would more or less fit into that, or maybe even Western New York, or maybe even the Northeast has a, you know, a sort of a similar climate. Um, but you live in a particular place. And how your land slopes, what kind of wind you get, um, how high you are altitude-wise, all that is, you know, um, all that's going to affect. Years ago, when you could hardly ever grow anything but Concord grapes in Allegheny County because it was just too cold in the winter, hmm. my German friend who came here from Germany as a young man had an, on his farm there was a stone foundation left from a barn that had been taken down, and it was about eight feet high and about two, three feet thick and about, I don't know, 20 feet long. And on the south side of that stone foundation wall, he planted three grapevines right up against the stone wall huh. because 
it, they were protected from the wind. They had that extra sun. The stones would heat up during the day yeah. and then radiate the heat back at night, keeping that little area warmer than it would be otherwise. Yeah. And he grew whatever, I forget what they were, green grapes that normally would not have grown here in Allegheny County because it was too cold. So you have to figure out where your warm spots are in the garden because that's where you want to put your peppers or your tomatoes or your right. watermelon right. or your eggplants, right? Um, the things that are hardy, they can go in the colder spots. Although, okay, but honestly, you don't want to build in what is called a, a frost pocket. What's a frost pocket? Well, I think most people know air, like water, flows downhill. Denser air, which is cold air, will flow down, which is why, by the way, in the spring and the fall, when you have those killing frosts, often the people in Wellsville or Hornell, they're down in the valley. Yeah. And at night, as the night cools, the, the colder air will sink down into the valley off the hilltops. And often they will get zapped and I won't because I'm up, I'm like 800 or a thousand feet higher than Wellsville or Hornell. So frost pockets, say you have a very gentle slope. Say you have a lawn and it's a very gentle slope. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, at the bottom of the slope, you built a stone wall or a hedge, or that's where you stored your bales of hay. Now, what's that gonna do? That cold air gently flowing down, think like a stream of water, down your lawn, trying to get away, runs into that block and sits there. So if you planted uh, dahlias, they're, they're tender, right? There in front of the stone wall, beautiful red dahlias against the gray stone. They're gonna be sitting in a frost pocket and they will probably get zapped off two, three, four weeks earlier than if they were not. Hmm. Okay. And so that's something to keep in mind. Um, let's see. So you could get rid of that frost pocket by moving your hay bales. You know what? <laughs> that comes from personal experience. Live, learn by doing. Um, years ago, that same German farmer friend would deliver like 200 bales of hay because that's what I used for mulch in those days. He, you know, you would... Um, always try and catch an early crop of hay before it went to seed mm -hmm. yeah and then it would get rained on and then you couldn't sell it for two three dollars a bale right but you could sell it a dollar bale for mulch right. and why you wanted that kind is it didn't have the seeds in it you don't want to be sowing uh grass seeds in your in your, no. in your vegetable no. garden no. and where did i store those bales on the south side of my garden 30 feet you know yeah. and yes <laughs> All right, um, I'll just divert here because I think it's really fascinating. My garden basically went 50 feet north to south and it was on like a 1% slope, which means if, and the high end was on the north side. So that meant if it went 100 feet, the lower end would be a foot lower than the higher, mm -hmm. 1%. So 50 feet, six inches lower. That's not much, is it, in 50 feet? Very no. great. No. Also, and it sloped south. Also, right behind the north end was um, a row of a windbreak of Norway spruce that the kids years ago had planted. So the garden on the north end had a little more frost protection for two reasons. It was close enough to the overhang of the woods that acted as a blanket. Mm -hmm. And it was a wee bit higher than the low end. And every now and again, if the temperature was just right, just around 32, plus or minus, you, or if it was slightly snowing, just at that 32 degree point, you could see a line in the garden about, about 20, 30 feet down from the north end, a little more than halfway down, there'd be no frost. But then you'd get a light layer of frost. Hmm. Just that slight difference in elevation that's amazing it is that's well you see it. yes and i remember once i used to do a craft show down in um um oh, what's the town 100 miles south in pennsylvania down down 15 and you come down out of the mountains 
on that two lane great road. And then there's the ridge that runs north south on your left side. And there was it was April, but there had been snow. But you saw the snow line and it was yeah. the same thing. Yeah. It just went, you know, well, which way would it go? Uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> the lower you got, it, it had rained and not snowed. Right. Yeah. 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 And because the, the road was sloped and the hill was sloped, the snow line was sloped. So, yeah, it's really fascinating. Um, <clears throat> all righty. Um, one, one thing, if you want to keep an eye on, the weather right around you through September, because you want to get a jump on that early frost so you can extend your garden. Um, my feeling is that if at around four o'clock in the afternoon in September, you look at your thermometer and it's not in the sun, you know, right. and if it's about 55 degrees or lower, and especially if the sky is going to be clear at night, Mm, yeah and if there's going to be no wind at night chances are overnight that temperature will drop down to the freezing mark yeah because usually day night is about 20 degrees difference summer winter so that's one general thing um and if you can save your garden that first time um then it will be extended and i I've always had a problem with the term Indian summer. I think we should name it white man summer, but we won't go there. <laughs> but it extends the, the season into that glorious autumn where the days are cool, but the nights don't quite freeze. Now, if you're gonna do something to save the garden, here's what I do. Probably within the next week or two, depending on what the general weather report suggests. By my back door, I pile up <laughs> all my old sheets, towels, mm. flannel blankets, and I have a bunch of boxes. And I even have um, some plastic hoops that I put out over my late planted lettuce so that it keeps growing longer. Um, and then I listen to the weather report. And if it looks like it's gonna get down close to the freezing mark, at five in the afternoon, I go out and I cover things up. Now, my problem on the hill is if it's windy, I have to have something to hold the, the flannel oh, yeah. or the sheets down, or even the boxes if it's gonna be very windy. Um, let me see here. And then you don't take them off till around 10 in the morning. Cause if it does freeze, Let's say it even goes down to say 25. It's going to take an hour or two to warm it up in the morning. Now, another thing that most people don't know, we mentioned in our June Zoom talk that I suggested you don't mulch your garden until the middle of June. And the reason for that was the soil was cold from the winter and for things to germinate now different peas will germinate in 40 degree soil but tomatoes won't mm -hmm. <laughs> um, everything has its own little narrow range which they like um, so you and you want the soil to warm up so things will grow faster also um, so you don't mulch your soil to keep it covered and cooler until around the middle of june the opposite is true in the fall. Your soil has soaked up the sun's radiant heat energy all summer long, even under a mulch. It's gotten warmer and warmer. And so, let me think. Let's say you have just one row of lettuce and it's, a si it's about five feet long. So you uh, a nice sheet from the an old bed sheet will do just fine. Um, so what I would do is I would put, if it's only five feet, I put like three stakes that would be maybe what 18 inches high or so and I would toss a, sh a sheet or a flannel blanket or a big towel over them and it would make like a tent and then I would have to put something on either side so it didn't blow away mm -hmm. however if you had taken the mulch away now you have the tent to protect it'll keep the heat that's there from radiating but the heat from the soil will also radiate back into the air 
right around your lettuce plants and make them a wee bit warmer than they would be otherwise. So you wanna do that every night? No, I would just um, maybe in early September, just remove the mulch or, oh. you know, or in the middle of September. Yeah, of the things you want to cover and, and prolong okay. their growing season. Okay. All righty. Now, there's two ways, basically, that frost will form, or another way of looking at it, the way fog forms. <laughs> Um, one is called radiation. And every night, whether it's the middle of summer, or the middle of winter, when the sun goes down, we lose our incoming heat source. And since we all know this, right? Heat travels from the hotter to the colder. That's why your walls aren't insulated. <laughs> your house can be very hot, the air but just to be cold because the uninsulated wall behind you mm -hmm. is gonna be colder than 98.6, which is your body temperature. Mm -hmm. And you are gonna start heating up the wall with your body. So you're gonna feel cold. So, um, so every night throughout the year, this happens. The sun comes up, it starts heating the earth. The sun goes down, the earth starts radiating the heat back into space. That's called radiation. Now, if at nighttime, when the sun goes down, say your temperature is 40, that's why the temperature keeps dropping at night because you're losing mm -hmm. the source of your heat. You've turned the, the radiator off, mm -hmm. the wood stove off, but the ground still has some latent heat in it and it's gonna be giving it back. And then it's like a seesaw. Is the air getting cold enough that the little bit of heat that's coming out of the ground can keep it above 32 or not. So anyway, that's called radiation. What do we got here? Do we have some pictures of frost? Can we put them all up? Because I haven't seen these yet. Let's see. Here's frost. This is a pretty one. Oh, yeah. Jack Frost came by in the night and painted your window. Can you tell if that is a spring frost or a fall frost? Oh, no, I can't. And I'm not sure there's a difference in that. It's a really amazing pattern. It is. It's, and um, we'll, we'll get into why that is in a few minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, what other kind of pictures have we got? Let's see. Let me click on share screen. Oh, okay. This one, you didn't ask for something like this, but it was mm -hmm. just really cool. Well, so gorgeous. I thought, yeah. <laughs> yeah. okay. We you can all admire this. And that is probably the same kind of frost, which I'm going to call a hoar frost, meaning white. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a few minutes after I talk about the second way we get frost. Mm. So the radiation frost we tends to be a mild frost and we usually can save our garden. However, you've heard of, what do they call it? The, the Alberta Clipper. Have you ever heard of that on a news report? The Alberta Clipper. Mm -hmm. That's usually in winter. And it's a, uh, um, a polar continent, continental air mass that comes down out of Canada, the Northwest out of Alberta, ah. Saskatchewan. And then the temperature just plummets. The whole air system moves through. It has nothing to do with the radiation, which is gradual. And sometimes it drops 20, 30, 40 degrees, you know, like overnight. That's pretty severe, but quite often yeah. 20 degrees. Now that's going to do, that's a killing frost or a black frost. And there's probably not much you could do unless you're really fanatical about it to save your garden at that point. Okay. Now, um, I want to... You know, I do have okay. one of the images that I have here. Is you go find them while I find my chart here. Why did okay. I put a piece of paper into? Um, it shows hoarfrost versus rime frost. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. and look at that. 
those i mean that's just okay which is that one um, rhyme ice okay and and asking, asking and which is which like oh. because it's in one direction it's usually from a fog and the wind so i would guess that's the rhyme wow yeah i mean some of those are yeah pretty intense okay um before we can explain what's going on here and how are we doing on time i get lost sometimes in that we have about 15 minutes left yeah okay we have time then um we have to talk first about humidity and dew point everybody's had the experience it's a hot day kind of humid mm -hmm. and boy would a nice glass icy glass of lemonade be great so you get the glass out of the cupboard you put in some ice cubes you pour in the lemonade um and almost instantly the outside of the glass is coated with dew really moisture well where the hell does that come from you know it's like where did that come from it's not raining well just very simply warm air can hold more moisture water vapor and water in the gas form than cold air so the warmer the air the more potentially humid it can be up to what they say 100 percent, which means for that given chunk of air at that given temperature and probably at that air pressure <laughs> forgot about that mm -hmm. um it can't hold any more moisture it's just totally saturated um so the dew point is what is the temperature at which a given body of air at a certain humidity is saturated and therefore begins to condense out which is why clouds form mm. Um, and why the water on your cold glass forms. So the dew point is the temperature at which a certain um, humid air mass will begin to participate out as dew if the temperature is above 32. So most spring, summer, fall, when we have humid weather, which is becoming much more common now than it used to be, you wake up in the morning and the gra ground is covered, the grass is covered with dew. Or with those beautiful spider webs that were out there in the grass, they're covered with the dew. However, I, I gotta look at the book because it gets kind of complicated. I don't want to forget what's what. If your temperature in the morning or overnight is um is 30, 32 degrees, is gonna go down below 32 say 32 mm -hmm. and your dew point happens to be below 32 which is possible nothing says the dew point has to be up here at 80 degrees or 60 degrees it can be down at 20 degrees so the temperature starts dropping at night passes 32 but doesn't reach the dew point until it hits 20 then it's totally saturated. But instead of coming out as dew drops, it comes out as frost. What we think of Jack Frost as pure ice crystals. Um, we all learned in eighth grade or whatever, everything has three phases. Gas, liquid, oh, yeah. solid. Uh -huh. And usually you go from one to the other to the other and vice versa. You don't skip something. But in this case, it goes directly from the, the gas in the air, the water gas, the water vapor, to the ice crystals, skipping the water part. And that's when you get the hoarfrost, the white frost, jack frost. And it's on the surface of your leaves or the trees. Um, and it's individual crystals. And usually it does not damage the plant enough to kill it. There we go. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. It, sorry, Kelly. It's a little hard to see because it's mm -hmm. I try to make it bigger and then it loses. Okay. Well, now let me see here what's going on. Sharpness. I can't tell from looking at that what kind of frost that is. No, I know I can't either. <laughs> to go outside and say, aha. You know, we get around here what I've seen 
more around here in the last few years is the we'll have the ice storm. That's totally different. Oh, where everything is outlined in the ice. Yeah, that's different. I mean, that's well, we can talk about that amazing. after we get through my frost things. Okay. Now, okay. <laughs> so, and I want to be sure I got this right here. Mm. The second, the, the third case is, once again, the temperature is going to be dropping past 32, going on down, but the dew point is quite a bit lower down. Maybe it's, maybe you'd have to reach 15 degrees before you hit the dew point. So what happens is the moisture in the air, it's 32, doesn't, doesn't make frost because it hasn't reached its dew point. But the liquid in the plant cells freezes at 32. That's what causes the black frost. That's what kills your plant. Yeah, yeah. Because when the ice expands, you know, within yeah. the cells, oh, really ruptures the cell membrane. Yeah. And then in the morning when it thaws, all the liquid leaks out. It's like dehydration, mm -hmm. like you didn't water your plants. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're dead. Alrighty. And the last case is, ha, 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 ha. Hmm. The dew points above 32. So the moisture starts coming out as dew. And then if it keeps going below 32, all those little dew drops freeze as little ice balls on your, the surface of your plant. <laughs> as really small, tiny? Yeah. Like dew would be real, real tiny. Have you ever looked? through a dew drop and seeing something upside down yeah 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 that's a whole nother optics thing yeah yeah now what you said about freezing rain is something totally different that's when the surface like your road your steps at your house mm -hmm. um your car overnight they they all got down to let's say 28 so they're below freezing but a warm air mass has moved in up in the atmosphere and so it's raining Oh. And the rain hits the super cool surface, instantly freezes. Yeah. Okay. So you have a glaze of ice. Yeah. And because it's thin, and it's, they usually think of black roads, that's why we we call it black ice. Black ice, ice yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, okay. Um, after I've totally confused you on all, all of that. <laughs> Where's my page four? One, two, three, four. Um, you can look up online. I, I'm just going to list, list a few. I would suggest come the middle of September, late September, when the chance of frost happening gets greater with every night, that you harvest. Hopefully you've planted <laughs> your... Yeah. <laughs> your tomatoes so and, and you start harvest you don't want your pumpkins to get frozen um in you, your bean you don't really your beans are going to be killed your tomatoes your pumpkins your squash your watermelon your peppers da, 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 da. those are all warm season tender crops so they're pretty much going to be done in however the following you can keep there's hardy and very hardy all greens whether it's spinach or lettuce or beet greens they're quite hardy in that I'm guessing 28 degrees they can survive without too much damage or any. So will broccoli, radishes, and potato tubers. A frost will kill the tops of the potatoes, oh, yeah. okay. but the tubers will be okay for another two, three, four weeks before we have a really hard frost. Then the very hardy, which actually if they're in a part of the garden that doesn't get too wet over the winter um, and you mulch them heavily, we'll, we'll keep all winter long. Those include beets and carrots and evidently cabbage and kale. Kale? Yes, as a matter of fact, this fellow says that kale can freeze and then thaw and be fine. We should try that okay. this year. And then yeah. there's what I call the super, super, super hearty. Your, and these three all taste better 
after they've been frozen once or twice. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't mean down to zero, but down to 25 or even 22 or something like that. Your Brussels sprouts, your parsnips are famous for that, and your rutabaga, which I guess I knew and forgot. They will all be sweeter because freezing changes the starch to sugar, which is why you don't store your potatoes in your refrigerator because you'll wind up with sweet potatoes, not the sweet potato <laughs> kinds, the white kind, <laughs> and they don't taste sweet. right. Yeah, white yeah. potato, right. So anyway, Kelly, if you're still there, do you have any questions? Don't know. Apparently not. No. Okay. What about you, Rima? We're almost out of time. Okay. Yeah. The one thing I just, I wanted to double check with you. Um, you said mulching in the fall to remove the mulch in the mm -hmm. mid-September. Yeah. Um, well, the reason that's confused okay. me is because I would think if you had, you would want to leave the mulch so that it would keep the, the warmth from the soil in so that the plants will oh, I see longer. what you're saying. Okay. But you know what? I'm not such a fanatic, especially as I get older. I don't want to have to run out every afternoon and take the mulch off of whatever plants I want the extra warmth to protect and then put it back on the next day. Also, I plant very close. So for me, that's almost impossible to do. But why not just leave the mulch there? Fine. Um, once again, that's fine. It's just okay. maybe you get a half a degree extra warmth from the soil that you won't get if the mulch is insulating it. So, so, the, so the mulch ends up turning, it, it changes and, and cools the plant instead of warming it. Keeps it, or lets it get colder than it would otherwise. Oh. See, it's an insulator. So in the spring, it keeps the ground cold and therefore the any kind of radiation from the ground right. less. But in the fall, it's the opposite. It keeps the warmth in the but soil. But don't you want that? Um, chances are at that point, the things aren't growing that much. Oh. They're just sitting okay. there. Okay. The carrots aren't probably getting any bigger. Okay. But they're staying fresh. Okay. That's my guess anyway. Because I know I've tried to grow some things, you know, in the spring it says 60 days to maturity. But in the fall, it's always more than that because your days are getting shorter and cooler. Okay. okay. Whereas in the spring, it's the opposite. Okay. Hmm. okay. All right. Are we done? Well, we're done. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 1225. And did you cut us off already? I did. Okay. I did. Sorry. That's right. No, that's, I just... I'm once again.